Happy Friday, everybody. How we doing? Uh, this is PT Pinecast. Welcome, everybody. A uh, podcast that saves PTs and PTAs from missing out on amazing insight, remarkable ideas, and motivational stories. Uh, I'm Jimmy McCann. I'm a physical therapist, but I play a radio DJ on the internet. Uh, broadcasting live from uh, the Arius Medical Studios. Find them online at aureusmedical.com. Leaders in hashtag travel physical therapy positions in all 50 states in all different settings. That's what they do. Leaders in uh, travel physical therapy. Get that website, aureusmedical.com. Uh, during the show, if you have that inkling, right? Like when you're in a presentation, you're like, oh, I kind of want to raise my hand. Uh, do that. Feel free. So uh, questions, comments, drop them below. If you're watching the show, we now live stream it on uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, the whole nine. Uh, drop the word live to let us know you're watching live. I'm always curious who's aboard live with us. Just drop us live and then geographically where you're from. I'm curious. I want to see if this thing's actually working. Is this thing on? It is on. Good. So drop that below live and then where you're from. And if you're watching to uh, the, the, the replay, uh, do replay and then the same thing where you are geographically always interested to see where these people are where are you from as we get some comments coming in bagby sean bagby watching it live what's up sean um also subscribe to the show uh on itunes on uh, spotify on stitcher deezer i mean you name your podcast uh, app we're on there subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode all right and again sometimes people they hear subscribe and they think it costs money. Just FYI, it does not. Subscribe with a podcast term uh, just means you're never, ever going to miss an episode for free. As Joanne says, what's up? Watching it live uh, from Michigan. Hello, Joanne. Welcome to the show. Interesting program for us tonight. I love the fact that this show, we, we kind of get into these different corners of the profession. And there's so many corners. Uh, we're talking about a lot of different things. Leadership and communication. Like what? What is leadership? Why is it required for behavior change in PT, both with your patients, with your colleagues in your practice? Some tactical things about how businesses have pivoted during COVID. And then something that is near and dear to my heart is communication. I love that stuff. So uh, let's dig into this with our guest who, uh, well, we just had on the show. She's coming back. Uh, guest tonight, CEO of Performance Physical Therapy a locally owned and nationally recognized multi-clinic practice employing over 200 amazing people. In addition, our guest is grateful to have the uh, opportunity to serve as the president of the APTA chapter in Rhode Island. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome back Michelle Colley. Back to the show. Michelle, how are we doing? I am really good, thank you, Jimmy. I Thank you so much, I really appreciate being here. Having you uh, back on the show, first question, always the hardest. What are we drinking, Michelle? Well, it's Friday night, so tonight's a little bit easier than last time. So I am drinking a margarita with yeah. my favorite Casamiga. It's a shame the bottle's almost finished, but some um, Casamiga um, tequila, some fresh lime juice, and some concho. How about that for Friday night? That's Clooney's, uh, that's Clooney's hooch, huh? It is, it is, yeah, yeah. How do you not trust something put out by George Clooney? You have exactly. to trust Clooney. I know, it's all, of, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm doing, because we're in the spirit, right? I'm just doing Corona. It's a Friday night, and I figure, why not embrace the uh, the current pandemic? It's been a long um, mm -hmm. week, or la half a week, that feels like a month. So I feel like this is very, it's going to be very cathartic to like just drop some weight off the shoulders. Like, what do you do in the last couple days because you've been ramping things up in terms of like meetings and whatnot, like like stuff with your with your practice while the whole election results things are going on. So that can't is that a good distraction? I'm guessing. Oh, it's a really great question. Yeah, it's a it's a fascinating time. I think the election adds a whole level of stress to every individual on top of what they're dealing with COVID. But with having an organization, I think it becomes even more important to have empathy and to create some structure and some normalcy. Otherwise people are just, you know, there's there's too many things that are uncertain in the world. So I think in, in a role, a, a leadership role or an organization, if you can provide some structure where people have control over things, then they feel better. Yeah, I think that, and we're going to dig into some leadership as Kyle Stapleton says, what up for North Carolina? Um, well, let's start Let's start with, with, with these topics. We're going to end with communication because that one, I feel like, like we could go off the rails in such a good way. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about 
PTs a while ago, we got that whole DPT thing in our in our profession right now. That's the that's the degree you have to have when you graduate. Um, but for some reason, we're not really we're not seen as the leader. Maybe we're not acting like the leader as the leading how to be the expert musculoskeletal provider. How do we get there? It wasn't just the degree, right? I mean, we, we know that, right? As communicators, you don't just slap a title on something. So where are we falling short? What do we need to do to become the expert musculoskeletal provider? Well, I don't really have a good solution to it because it drives me crazy. I think of it more of as a problem, but with any problem, you have to bring awareness to it first. But I think it comes back to the behaviors. Are we instilling the behaviors into our physical therapists? The title, DPT, doctor, whatever, but you have to have the underlying behaviors there of professionalism, of communication, advocacy, being responsible and taking responsibilities for who we are and the value that we provide. And I still see it. I mean, I don't see it at Performance PT. Well, actually, I'll admit that I sometimes still do. Let's be real. Is the, the physical therapist still looking for referrals or not willing to call the referring physician if there is one because they're worried, well, maybe the physician doesn't want to talk to me. Right. And how do we help our physical therapist have the communication skills to be able to advocate the value of what they do? How do we get our PTs to not just treat a knee problem or back pain, but actually be comfortable speaking to every single person they deal with about the importance of exercise and diet and sleep and nutrition and stress relief? Because all of those things have significant impact on chronic disease and the downstream cost to our society, economically, as well as quality of life and those things. I don't know what the solution is, but I think it's something that needs to be spoken about a lot more to get our PTs to behave as the experts in MSK care. All right. So maybe I asked, maybe I asked the question that was too big, right? Let's, let's flip that around. What do you do? Because I mean, you know, with, with the organization you work for performance, physical therapy, 200, yeah. you know, amazing individuals, as you, as we said in your, uh, in your intro, get to work with you. How do you instill that on just one person? Let's say you have someone who comes aboard and they're a great clinician. How, what are the things that you want to instill in their in their new DNA as they come board with you um, to make sure that they're better communicators? Up their game just a little bit. Yeah, I think it's a great question. So, you know, obviously we've made a lot of mistakes over the years and, and hopefully learned from them. And what we now do is we ensure that we have a real, really thorough onboarding process. And that onboarding isn't just about how to learn the EHR and schedule patients and things like that. So you've got the, you know, how do you manage your day-to-day -day stuff? But now we actually have a full clinical, um, clinical mentoring program. And whether you're a new grad or experienced, that clinical mentoring from day one, yes, it brings in the clinical skills, but it talks a lot about how you communicate with referral sources. What's your role in the community? What does professionalism look like? What does management of a patient look like? So I think working with people from day one and instilling those behaviors of professionalism. I also think we've got an organization that from day one, we really try and drive by our values. And our values come down to providing the best care, investing in relationships and embracing change, which I know sounds kooky. Who would have thought that embracing change? We've had that there for years, but I think that we have to continue. Our, our society and our communities keep evolving and changing. So we have to keep evolving how we provide best care. And that's just not how you manipulate or dry needle. Right. These are about customer service. These are about philanthropic endeavors. These are about communication with patients and, um, and instilling those values from day one. So yeah. for us, it's been about a really strong mentorship program, really open communication and various channels of communication and taking care of our people and, and having the expectations and being very clear these are our expectations of how you treat other people. It sounds like a lot, a lot of the basics. And if you get away from the basics early on, that the complicated stuff um, is doesn't seem possible. And also, like I, I want to focus on something like like that you that you said a second ago, which was education. Like you said, listen, where the bathroom is or how the EHR works, like that's important with onboarding, but also how we communicate. This is how we do things. This is how we communicate. And, you know, it might sound hokey to bring up values, but if I don't know what we stand for, how do I know how to act, right? Those are expectations. If I don't have expectations set for me for a leader, I'm constantly wondering, am I doing the right thing? If you give someone values and good expectations and then put them in a situation where they're completely lost, 
they just fall back on those values and expectations. They can make a great next decision. Exactly. And I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm old compared to the young, all the young people out there. I mean, I'm 49. So I've been around a while, but you know, 20 years ago, I thought that values were kind of stupid, but the older I get, the more I realize that these values are what helps people know what are the right behaviors. I would love, and I sometimes do, to destroy our handbook and our policies and procedures and all of that. You don't need any of it. Just like, just here are the values. You do these things, you'll be fine. It's as easy as that. And, it's, and it does sound really simple, but it takes then a huge amount of discipline to make sure you've got the, the systems in place and they turn into habits. But I think that's the part where we fall apart. Like we can talk about values and all of that, but then you have to put the discipline in to hold yourself accountable to those and make sure you do the, you know, provide those opportunities and embrace those newer people to grow and evolve. And don't just say you're going to do it, but really do it and then have surveys and get feedback and measure it. You know, if you're not measuring it, you're not doing it. And again, we've all heard those things before, but it's really true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was it then? Because I would agree, right? I mean, at one point, something was cheesy and you didn't embrace it. And then at some point in your life, it flips. Like for you, what was it? Like what was what was really saying, hey, what 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 are my values? And just looking and taking stock, what was it? For, was it a moment? Was it something in the clinic, out of the clinic or in a business like arc? Like where in your story, what did it all of a sudden be like, hey, yeah, this is important now? I think there was a couple of things. I think, first of all, I'm obviously not from this country, um, in case you couldn't tell. And when I first um, took on performance physical therapy, I mean, it, it was it's it's almost 18 years ago. I was a clinic director and um, at a clinic that had just started up 20 years ago. And, and the original owner said, I want out. And I was actually eight months pregnant. So I was a little loopy when I was pregnant. And I'm like, yeah, I'll buy the clinic. Because they was like, you know, I'm like, I'll do it. You know, we were 16 employees. I, I knew nothing. I didn't even know what a P&L was. I remember my first day owning it saying like, what are financial statements? I mean, I was dumb, but I was really pregnant and I loved PT. I All loved right. PT. But with being from a different country, I also wanted to be able to travel back to New Zealand and spend a couple of months. And I realized the only way I could do that was to really understand objectively what was going on. So right early on, I was creating, I love stats as well. So I was creating spreadsheets and I didn't realize at the time, but I was really getting into KPIs. And then really over time, I suddenly realized how important the behaviors are and how that changes what your key performance indicators are. So I think it was an evolution over time. And I think I was thinking, yeah, I want to own this practice and have this great place for people to work and take care of patients. But I want to sneak down to New Zealand for a month or two when I've got a young baby. The only way I can do that is to objectively have a know what's going mm -hmm. on. And I think it was sort of, I think I was in an opportunity to learn quickly the importance of behaviors and then how that results, how that then impacts the numbers. Yeah. Well, it sounds like, yeah, behavior change, right? Like it was like, okay, if I want to be able to put this on uh, autopilot or be able to walk away for a little while and know that everything's operating how it would be if I were here or as close to that would be as possible, you set up numbers. So you went objective, but then you went a step further and went, okay, well, subjectively, what? Do, how do we need to act to make sure the objective things happen in this clinic and we keep do that? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, that was a big one. I think there was another interesting time when, um, you know, I didn't know about marketing or advertising and I, you know, put a random ad in somewhere and I could never re measure the return on investment. I didn't understand. Yeah, I paid $2,000, threw it away. I don't know if it did anything. So I woke up one day and I said, that's it. I'm not spending any more money on marketing or advertising, actually. It wasn't really marketing. I feel like I'm just throwing it away. So I'm just, I would rather just give the money away. And so at that stage, we cut, I crossed out advertising and said this, now we're going to give it away. This is now philanthropy. Wow. So from that day on, I flipped it and we really invested in what we do in the community. So, you know, now we do a huge amount of things in the community and seeing those behaviors and how good people feel with them, but also how it's helped our organization has been amazing. I mean, we have you know, care to wear days and, fundraising. We won the most philanthropic business a few years ago. 
but um, it's been very cool again to see how that communication, integration, doing the right, those behaviors actually ultimately have a really positive impact on your business. And you want a profitable business because that gives you the capacity to be to be nimble and deal with crisis such as COVID. And it gives you the opportunity to do new things and grow and evolve and give financial freedom to your staff. So, you know, you need to be profitable to take care of your people. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it seems a lot just listening to the arc of your story. You, you know, jumped in and decided to buy a clinic and you were like, I don't know what a P&L is, but hey, and I always tell people all the time, if you don't, if passion isn't the first thing, if you're not super passionate about something, it, it kind of doesn't matter how skilled or talented you are. It doesn't. So you jumped in, you're like, okay, I love this. I'm bad at it, but I can get better at it. Like this is not, you know, like learning the financials is not impossible. It could be daunting and difficult, but it's not impossible. So you jumped in and did that. You go from saying, and I don't know if you noticed the words you use, instead of throwing the money away, I invested it, right? So instead of throwing it away on marketing, because I didn't, you weren't measuring it. And I tell people all the time, advertisers for this podcast, hey, I want to like jump on for a few weeks or a month. I'm like, don't, because this is a long play. It's a long play and you're not going to see results right away. And I don't want you to do that and throw the money away and then not get anything and go, podcasting doesn't work. So I love the fact that you you invested it in your community. You saw returns because an investment is a smarter way to throw it away. And then what did you do? Because you now run a SIG within the private practice section because you didn't know anything about marketing, but tell everybody what SIG you wound up running. <laughs> yeah, I'm the president, I'm, I'm the chairperson for, yeah, marketing and PR. So yeah, and I love the marketing and I love the marketing because it is communication. Right. And I've seen it's something that when you invest in it, and when you do it right, it can have a tremendous return. Deal. And, it, and and that too, and we'll talk about this later, is basics. So we'll get to basics. That's the teaser that's coming up. It's, it's communication is basic. So yeah, throwing money away all the time, that's super bad. Investing in basics and being able to and being able to objectively measure it, that's better. Um, let me ask you this. What leadership characteristics are required for behavior change in PT? So PT to a patient or clinic owner to a clinician or you know, business to a community? I feel like all these things have to like they're just relationships, right? On different levels. So what what's required for behavior change in these in these different environments or so these different relationships? That's a, that's a really interesting question. I think at the end of the day, they're all exactly the same. They're all about investing in relationships and putting effort and time and listening and empathy and all of those characteristics that we know. And as physical therapists, I think, yes, we're taught how to do it with patients. Okay, you know, maybe not perfect, but we're taught how to do it with patients. But physical therapists, in my experience, have had difficulty taking that skill set and transforming it into being a clinic manager or an owner or the relationships with the community or referral sources. Everything they know, what they do with patients, active listening, follow up, you know, all of those things. You, you stick a referral, a fancy orthopedic surgeon in front of them and they freeze up. And I'm like, it's exactly the same. It's the same thing. You have to put the work in. You have to follow up. And I don't know how to help our PTs. Well, I, I think I know. I don't know how to help. Well, I try to. I keep trying. <laughs> Is that the same skill set that you have with your patients? It's exactly the same for it everything else you do. It is. So how do we get them to do that? Uh, for me, I would say repetition, right? Repeti yeah. Well, first of all, like you said, setting expectations. Mm -hmm. When people are anxious, and I consult people in communications in my day job with Fox Rehabilitation and just kind of you know, anywhere, we're friends. When you, when, and this is from the book, um, Negotiate Like Your, like your Life Depends On It, uh, uh -huh. great book. And when you speak to someone's anxiety, when you highlight it, it actually reduces their anxiety. So if Michelle were doing a presentation tomorrow at the Northeast Regional Conference virtually, which I know you are doing, and she was like, hey, Jimmy, I'm super, I'm super nervous um, tomorrow because I got to do this virtually and I don't feel comfortable with this and this, I would say, man, this sounds like it's really scary to you. Like it almost seems counterintuitive, like don't bring it up. Don't mention how scary it is. But we know from research that actually bringing it up, this is from a, a FBI hostage negotiator. So trust me, this dude wasn't doing anything to put anybody on edge. He, when you speak to someone's anxiety, it actually brings it down because you've taken the monster out of the closet and you've said, here it is. Let's talk about it together. I think that's number one. 
I think it's a great point and I would highly recommend anyone to listen to that book because I think even as a PT, you, it makes you be a better communicator with your patients. I think the other part, and this is what I often work with our clinicians and our staff with, is you find a common ground. If the first thing that I do is say to you, I'm not going to say to you, Jimmy, how are you? Because that's kind of a boring thing to say. I'm going to be like, you did it to me when we got on earlier. Wow, it's been a really crazy week. And we both nod. And now we're friends because we have this common, like we felt the same thing. So it's that emotional thing. Yep. So even when I talk to a referral source now, and yeah, we see uh, lots of our patients are direct access. I'm not saying that we're just out there trying to get patients from docs, but I need to have good relationships with all the physicians and, and providers in the community. I'm not going to say to them, how are you? I'm going to say, hey, you know, it's been a really challenging year. I, I certainly empathize. How are you guys managing it? What's been, how, how's your, how is your practice getting through this time? Yeah. And open-ended questions, but with empathy, the same way we do with our patients. Because you don't say to your patient with low back pain, hi, how are you today? Right. You're like, yeah, your back hurts. It really sucks. I'm really sorry. Let's get on. It's that, um, how do you get that really fast emotional connection? Yeah. I always say if you want if you want someone to think that you're interesting and like interesting in a way that like I would like to interact with this person, right? If you want someone to think that you're interesting, be interested. Just be interested. Like exactly. how's your week going? Like man, this is a really this is a long week like as we watch the news and just spin around this news cycle. That's again speaking to someone's that you know speak the anxiety speak speak about the elephant in the room. It brings it down, but it also opens them up like oh, and then I will also add this asking a question and giving people enough time to actually answer. Like, especially, I don't know, is this, is this a new, is this an American thing or is this a, you know, like, Hey, how you doing? Good. How are you? Like, no, no waiting. Just like, it's, it's a, it's a cliche. Is that just an us thing? Yeah. I don't know the answer to that question, but, um, I don't know. Or is it a generational thing or is yeah. it evolved? I'm not sure. Do they do that in New Zealand? Well, I haven't lived there for a long time, and I can't. Who knows when I can even go back now, too, with COVID? Right. <laughs> yeah. So, so, but what you're saying as well, you also brought up a great point. Um, and I'm speaking tomorrow at the same conference that you are. So, Rhode yeah. Island, uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, all together. We'll put the link in the comments below. It's live tomorrow throughout the day. But if you if you jump into the conference, you've got access through the end of the year. It's pretty legit. Um, I'm doing the 12 commandments of communication and the number one commandment, I don't want to spoil it or anything. And they're, and they're all, you know, it's just number one because it was the last one is you need to honestly be yourself because, and I used to work with radio DJs, all the, this is part of my job as a radio DJ was I was the program director. I also, you know, took them off the air and said, Hey, how can we improve? And number one for me was, listen, if you're disingenuous, if you're the radio DJ and this is how you're talking, people might not know exactly what's fake, but they'll detect fake and they'll just be like, no, nah, I don't like it. I'm out. And they'll leave. And they, to get them back, they don't They don't want to feel that someone is being not them, themselves. They won't be able to put their finger on it, maybe. Or maybe they will, but they'll detect wrong and they'll be like, I'm out. I don't like it. Well, I think you hit on something really important, and that's the trust factor. They don't trust you. And if you don't trust a product or a person, they don't feel good around you. They don't want to have a relationship. And the key of, you know, um, uh, therapeutic alliance or, you know, public relations, and people all the time will say, like, well, public relations, that's like marketing and spin and, and flashy. I'm like, no, man, because I learned communications and public relations and journalism from Franciscan friars. I went to a Catholic university. So like it was no frills, right? I mean, believe me, I had a dude in a habit, like a brown robe with a rope around his waist, Brother Basil. And he's like, what's public relations? And everybody's like this. And they're shooting out like answers that are sounding like, you know, they've come from like Madison Avenue. And he was just like, <sighs> public relations is building a relationship with the public. Like it's literally in the question. And I was like, oh, so I can figure some of this stuff out. Like you can, you can reason your way to better communicating if you think about it as if how would I say this to my best friend or my mom or a patient or a provider or an entire practice or a giant presentation. It's the same principles because you're talking to a human who has a brain who likes to receive information how we like to receive information. I think you bring up, you know, I, I could just listen to you talk about this all day and I will tomorrow when you present. That'll be great to hear is I think it's that authenticity as well. 
And I do think, um, you know, many people are so worried what people think or, you know, I'm not as smart as I, I'm going to get found out that I'm not as smart as what people might think I am. And I think it takes a level of maturity and time to sort of get over those things and just be like, yeah, you know what? It's okay that I might not be that smart. And there's a lot of things I don't know. And I'll admit it at this stage. Smartest people, though. I mean, the smartest people in our profession, the smartest people in science will tell you like, hey, this is what I know now. Yeah. Not that this is this is it, period. But this is what this is what I understand to know now. And if anybody else has other, I would I would be very open to that. Like how like it's not an accident that the smartest people and the most successful in our profession are the ones that are typically most open to learning new stuff. Like that's not an accident. Like pay attention to that. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that's that's one of my my commandments out of the 12. And the other one, what you just uh, kind of spoke about was which is if you don't practice your presentation it's going to come across kind of disingenuous, like, right? Like I put out a tweet, a poll on Twitter. How many times do you practice your presentation before you give it? Like zero, one to three, uh, you know, more, whatever. And most people zero and they wing it or one to three. And I bet you if I deep dove into that, those one to three times is like looking at the slides and saying it to yourself. And I'll tell you this from experience, from 15 years in broadcasting, and I'm pretty damn good at winging stuff. That is not actual practice. Thinking about it in your mind is not doing an exercise. It ain't doing it. It's not it. It's zero reps. So I bet you a lot of those people who said one to three is that are actually a zero. I don't know. That's my guess. But yeah, like I mean, I, I'm pretty good at talking. I got three bullet points to talk to uh, Michelle about tonight. Broad. But I bet you we could talk for 45 minutes, right? Because I have reps. But if I'm giving a pointed, because this is a conversation, but that's a presentation. You got to go through the reps. So I put the presentation together a week, week and a half. Well, I started a month ago with a big, just a blank, I don't know, this, this, this. That's why I was doing the 10 commandments, but now it's 12 because I found two extra things and it grew. And then, I, then like about four days ago, I started putting the slides together. Okay. Now what pictures need to go? A lot of people do it the other way. They put these slides together. Then they're, no, 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 no. Your ideas are more important. That's why they asked you to present. Trust me, man, and ate your slides. Um, so yeah, I could geek on you know communication. But tell everybody what you're what you're talking about uh, tomorrow. What's your topic, and like what are they going to learn? So we are doing a panel discussion. I'm hosting a panel discussion on telehealth. I have three wonderful clinicians, and we will be covering outpatient sniff academics, all about telehealth. And I think the exciting part is is that as the host, I'm going to try and pretend not to be an advocate of telehealth. I'm going to be the naysayer and be like, tell me why, you know, lots of people say telehealth isn't physical therapy. All right. Tell me it shouldn't be paid the same. So I really want to get into those naysayer things and, and help people understand where the value is and challenge some of the beliefs we might have, bring up some of the research that's come out just recently. And, but I think telehealth to me is a fascinating subject because it really brings up the importance of communication oh, yeah. and management and the value and how the kind of relationships that we have. So yeah, I mean, here's the other thing is I love manual therapy. I love dry needling. If I was treating, you'd see me, I have my hands all over you and dry needling and all of that. But over the years, you know, I've come to respect that that stuff's easy to learn. Just like I learned how to do the finances, that communication part, is the valuable part. And that's why I think telehealth is so important and we'll continue to advocate for it as being a really key access point to care for our patients. I like that. I like how you're, and you're doing exactly what I mentioned before, right? With what they said in that book, which is you're speaking the anxiety. All right, telehealth's great. Tell me why. Like, yeah. I don't, you know, we should, we should get paid the same amount. Prove me, prove me wrong. Yeah. It's not like that meme of the guy sitting outside with the folding table, you know, like, you know, telehealth shouldn't get paid the same. Prove me wrong. Like, if it's legit, let's make sure it's legit. Let's have the research. And we're working on that right now. So that's cool. Who's with you? Who are, who's on the panel? Um, I have Jordan Madigan, who's an okay. Australian PT who works at Performance. He's awesome. I have, oh gosh, now I'm going to forget all their names. Isn't that okay. terrible of me? Amy Perrin, okay. um, who is in Connecticut, and um, Jane oh, from MGH. Oh, okay. awesome. Yeah, so um, academics from there. So um, a good diverse group that are uh, very respected in their different areas. Good. If you're watching this live in the in the uh, the comments below is the link to the uh, to the New England conference, which is, again is going live tomorrow. 
which is wow, November seventh is tomorrow. Isn't it crazy. I don't know. That was a real weird like time. I was like, it, it's the conference is November seventh, but how can no, tomorrow be November seventh? It is. Um, but if you if you're listening to the replay or listening to the podcast, we'll put the link in the show notes. The content is available recorded uh, through the end of the year. So like you know, go in there and turn this into your morning commute. Um, CEU sort of, you know, deep dive and just listen to, you know, you know, to and from you use it as that. Um, let's talk specifics on pivoting during COVID. Uh, <laughs> pivot is a good word. Um, I'm trying to think of a better word, which is complete revamp or, you know, complete pulse check. How, let's go micro. How did you do it at performance? Like what are the, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot, but like, what are some of the big ones that you'd want people to hear? So maybe they can learn. Well, it's been interesting because I've had to reflect lately because I'm doing my paperwork for PPP loan forgiveness. So in some of that, you kind of got to go back and sort of attest to what happened. And um, I think the big thing that I did was something that was probably really stupid. And I've actually been told I was stupid to do it, is that on March 16th, the governor in Rhode Island um, was really, what did she mandate? She mandated... I think at that stage you had to wear masks and everything was shutting down really fast and our staff were getting nervous. We didn't know what, how are we going to manage this? Um, I called up a guy I knew from Better PT and was like, we need to know how to do telehealth like today. And um, we weren't, we, no one was paying for it. And on March 18th, we closed our doors. And I, and I still, I think they recorded it because I think I cried in front of my staff because we put out an announcement, we said, as of this afternoon, we are closing all our doors and we are going to 100% telehealth. We um, we're, we maintained a 40% of our caseload of patients. Wow. And, but the weird thing was, is we weren't getting paid for it. So I was like, well, I don't, I don't feel we, from a public health standpoint, I don't know how to manage this. This is a public health issue. And I know the Surgeon General had put out, hey, you know what, you know, PT is essential service. And I completely agree with them. So I was like, well, we can still provide access to care, but we'll do it through telehealth so we keep everyone safe. Now, I definitely got some flack from it from nationally, just from other PT practices to say, how can you close your doors? How can you put more value on telehealth? What are you crazy? You're not going to get paid for it. But I was like, I, I can't sleep at night. We're going to close the doors. And our staff were amazing. Wow. So all of our PTs stayed on full time. I never furloughed any PT except for a few per diem people. I kept everyone on their full salaries, didn't wow. touch a thing. And they all went home on Fridays with their laptops, with webinars, things to watch, learn, manage their schedules. We did temporarily lay off a bunch of admin people in the clinics, but everyone else went home, managed patients, and, um, you know, and, and people worked super hard and yeah, now, and then we did that and we managed to maintain at 40% caseload. We dropped to about 38%. And then within three to four weeks, once we figured out how to safely reopen, we started the soft reopen and bringing, gradually bringing people back. Oh, good for you. You need some kudos on that because like, that's like, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to think of a parallel. Like one day you're doing physical therapy one way and the next day it's Friday, grab a laptop and watch a webinar. And on Monday, you're doing it completely different. It's like, and tomorrow you're an astronaut, but you're a physical therapist, but on the moon. So it's a similar, but by the way, completely different. Yeah. Yeah. That's it, crazy. it was crazy. And I, and I you know, I, I could never do this without, without having an incredible team. The hours and the coaching and the talking to with our staff and our senior leadership team. I mean, I we didn't sleep, we didn't do anything for that. Right. For, I mean, but it was like that for everyone. Um, yeah, it was really amazing to see how our staff managed it and then to see us come back in. And yeah, and we're back. I mean, we ramped up very quickly in the clinics, but with very strict guidelines and um you know, and I'm excited at this stage. We're still big advocates of telehealth. I see the winter coming. I think it's going to get really bad again. Yeah. Well, and we, as we're talking, we keep setting records, right? Like it was 120,000 cases. Yep. And that's like the third news story of the day. That's yeah. the third news story of the day. It's 120,000 cases. The most ever is the third news story. Yeah, exactly. And so I, I know I hear lots of people say, oh, we're about to go back to normal. I've heard it for months. I'm like, 
We're not. And so we have to have contingency plans. Yeah. And if you've got an organization where you were on a care for patients, you're going to have to figure out a different way to do it. Yeah. You still want to deliver the same service, but like, can you do it differently? Absolutely. Like industries either you, you, you adapt or you go extinct. I don't want to be cliche, but right. But that's what happens with, with dinosaurs. You either, you adapt or you become extinct. Good for you too, because like we, we, we talk a lot about, and we've done a lot of episodes on COVID and about, you know, uh, you know patient caseloads and percentages. Like you're, you're talking about like rent and food and child, like you're, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's, it is providing care to the patients. Agreed. But like you're also talking about like rent and car payments and food and mortgages and people's lives. Like your clinic, like the people that trusted you and you trust to you know to be your bit. They are your business. Yeah, that's a big deal. No, you're right. And I think actually one of the cool things that many of our PTs did. One of the first things we put together for all of our therapists. Yeah, you you just you could just got to manage your patients. But we did all this, you know, tons of Facebook live events and all of that. And we also put lists of resources together. So we're like. Here's what supermarkets are delivering. Here's some online exercise classes you can do. Right. If you're having symptoms, this is what you do. So we right. add all of those things. David Petrino, who I've had on the show a bunch of times, he's an Australian, but he works out of New York City. They were doing that like in like April. Yeah. They literally were explaining to people, mm -hmm. uh, mostly older adults who mm -hmm. maybe have never used Uber Eats or a DoorDash, and they were essentially doing like mini master classes on here's how you order groceries from Peapod. And then they said, great, now do it in Spanish. Now do it in Portuguese. Now do it in this. And they were like, because he was in New York City. He's like, English ain't it, guys. That, that's hitting a portion. But like, we need everybody to do this. Yep. And that's that's a great like positioning of like how a PT can uh, effectively use a relationship they've already built with people to say, I understand you trust me for low back pain. And now we have a relationship. Hey, how are you getting your groceries? So they have the relationship and they go, oh, I can learn more. And so it doesn't make sense until it makes sense. Exactly. We had um, a couple of our PTAs because they weren't doing telehealth. We, we don't have a lot of PTAs. But what we did with them, I thought was cool, is we had them, we gave, they all had their phones. We said, here's all the Medicare patients that we've seen in the last year. Just call them. Do not, we don't want to see them as patients. I mean, if they need it, but you're going to call them and say, hey, mm -hmm. remember me, this is who we are. We're checking on you. Do you need anything? Big deal. That's it. And we did it for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. What does, AC, what does APTA say, right? We want to transform society. Yeah. So we're looking after society. We're trying, you know, in our little corner, like, what can I, you know, what, what, you know, what part of the driveway can I shovel when, it, when we've just been dumped on? All right, well, I can do this. And so do that. Do that, do that when you can. But good on you for empowering those people to do it. Well, it's, it's it's kind of like, this is our value. Like this is something we value. So do that. Yeah, so we have our purpose at performance, empower our communities to lead healthy, happy, and fulfilling lives. So that we just keep saying that. Like, what can we do in a pandemic? Which, which is kind of an scope of practice. What can we do to play right. our part? And the relationships, and it all works out. And yeah. And it has for us so far. I mean, I'm grateful, but I'm still will need to be careful in the months to come. All right, drink some tequila because here comes the next question. So to two questions. So biggest failure and biggest success. So we'll start with failure. Right? We'll start with the negative. But like, you know, obviously failure in terms of like, oh yeah, we stepped in it, but we learned. And then biggest success. Like what were those? In regard, in regard to COVID? Yeah, because that's the big month. That's the yeah. big month in the room. Biggest failure with COVID. Um, oh, that's really... <laughs> there's so many of them. I'm kind of like, all right, where do I start? What's the thing that you wish you could be like, do over? Like, I'll, I'll take a mulligan on this if I could. Um, you know, I think we did a good job with communicating. However, you can always do better. I always think that communication is one of those things you can never be a, you can never be amazing at, just like time management. You can always do better. Yeah. If I was going to go back in time, I would have been, I would have started like the town hall meetings and the um, all of those kinds of different, the variety of communication platforms, I would have done that earlier. So we would say like, oh, we'll just do an, it, we'll just do a live Zoom thing, and then I'd realize afterwards that half the people didn't have the bandwidth to listen to me anymore. They wanted to read it. So then I would put it in. The, so it took me a while to realize that you can't just have one communication methodology in a in a organization. 
you have to have a written, you have to have a newsletter, you have to do Facebook, you have to do that. I mean, you have to have multiple different ways to meet your people where they're at. Oh, look at you, number seven. Number seven. You have to have, like the average person, the rule of sevens, right? If people haven't heard this, you've got to touch a, a person Seven, about seven times. There's, I have no research on this. I, d- I actually did research on, hey, where'd this rule of seven that I've heard my entire professional career come from? It came out of, it's just kind of one of those magical rules of thumb where it's like, but like, let's just say the number isn't seven. The number's more than one. It's more than one. It's more exactly. than one. So this is what I preach all the time, which is, and I, and I try to put it on like your kids, right? And I don't have any kids, but like I, I kind of am a kid. If you ask me to clean my room one time, I got news for you. It's probably not getting done, right? So you've got to do it a couple different ways, right? Hey, I really need you to clean your room. Hey, have you cleaned your room yet? So one's a, one's a direction and one is a question. That's just, that's two right there. But you've probably got to get to seven. But you also mentioned something else there, which I started smirking because I'm like, yes, which is type of media. So maybe... And and it's not even like so. Sky Donovan, my uh, professor at Marymount, taught me this too. Like in research, like visual learners and auditory learners and stuff like that, that's still hanging around. She's like, yeah, they actually kind of figured it isn't. And I was like, what do you mean? I consider myself, you know, this. And she goes, well, think about this. If I said I'm going to teach you how to drive, but you're a you're an auditory learner, do I just tell you how to drive, but I never put you in the car? Like no. Like so, what I'm getting at is. What I need you to do is dependent on the type of media. So that's how we do it. So, but yeah, why, why, why are we recording this via video? Because some people want to watch this for a video and some people want to hear it a podcast and the podcast is broken down into show notes and that's a little bit of a synopsis. And then I break it into little clips on social media. So like you need to hit, because I'm trying to hit that number seven and I'm trying to do it a bunch of different ways with pictures and graphics and little video clips. Like this works inside of a business the same way because you're still talking to people. Period. Hard stop. Great points, Jimmy. And I think that if I could change one thing about how I dealt with the start of COVID, I wouldn't have just relied on, hey, we're going to do this town hall style virtual meeting. I would have attacked it from seven different modes at the same, yeah, at slightly different times to meet our people where they're at rather than me thinking, yes. I think they should take the time to listen to me. Right now, the town hall idea is a good idea, though. Like, it is a good idea. Do that. Yep. But also, how do I now? How do I? Okay, I hit fifty percent of my audience. Great. I, I also missed fifty percent of my odds. Okay, how can we hit them? Do another town hall? Well, no. You just no. Okay, now town hall fifty percent. How can I get twenty more? I'll do it as a blog post. I'll do it as graphic. Whatever. So that's a good example. All right. So if that's your failure, that's a pretty good failure. Like that's because I think that's a common one. So. Yes. Yep thing that you're most proud of with you and your team like like what was it what came out of it um i think i was um I th- i'm pretty proud of the fact that we pulled off the telehealth thing yeah and so- then we ultimately got paid for it and we're i think we had the first private payer here blue cross in rhode island was the first to verbally the day after we went live i was on the COVID task force on this national call also speaking to our blue cross rep and he was like, we're going to do it, Michelle, we're going to do it. And I'm like, yeah. And it was kind of the start of helping, again, helping us see how relationships and advocacy can actually work. Oh, and, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. And I found that really a, a wonderful gift during COVID. I know we sometimes aren't always happy with our payers, but I've always made a point to have really good relationships with them. And so we can have really frank conversations. And it's been really helpful through this challenging time. That's a good point that I don't think I've ever even thought of, which is like, man, yeah, relationships with payers. Like we like to paint them as the bad guy um, all the time, right? They don't get it and they don't pay. But like you can bitch about it. We can bitch about it together. It doesn't do anything. What can you do to move the needle 1% in your direction? I don't know. Build a relationship. Build a bridge. Not a wall. Exactly. Build a relationship. And then you have the opportunity when the time is right to help them truly see the value of the we do because yeah. that person to want we paid enough because we don't have any relationships with payers we haven't shown our value because we're in our little silo going oh, i just want to treat patients and we're really great but we have to open up our communication methodologies and ways we do it with a much broader group 
dare we say, ruthless communication, as Sky Donovan chimes in on Facebook. Uh, she says she learned uh, the hard way. This is uh, this is a great lesson why I wanted to bring it on the screen. She said she learned the hard way. People have to be ready to receive the message. She said, I just expected they were all ready when I delivered. Not true. Repetition was key. Like, And I say all the time, George Bernard Shaw said, like, the biggest failure in communication is when you think it has occurred. I'm going to say that again. I didn't make this up. Again, George Brown Shaw. Brilliant. The biggest failure in communication is when you, the sender, think it's occurred. So you said something and you're like, everybody understands what I understand now. No, they don't. Um, and if there's a miscommunication or if it's not if it's not fully received, you as the sender, the originator of the communication, has to take more ownership over the audience. That's the teacher in the classroom. You got to own it. Not all of it. like you know, But you have to say like, all right. Is this on me? You have to repetitively say, did I fail here? Ruthlessly self-evaluate your communication. I love that word ruthless. I, 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 I mean, ruthless communication, absolutely. And I think it's an extremely good point that do not make assumptions or judgment that the listener understood you or is ready to hear you. No, those two things important. Because we, I think we talk about it a lot in like um, motivational interviewing, which is like everything's a question. And, a, and a, what I think I hear you saying is this, is that, did I get that right or whatever? That's good for the listening, but also like understand they might not be ready to receive that or the way you're sharing. I don't understand what you're saying. I was trying to talk a friend today through, um, through improving his, his social media because he does he doesn't like it, but he understands he needs it, but he doesn't want to do it. And I was trying to do it through text message, and he finally just said, "I don't learn this way." And I was like, "You know what? I don't I don't want to teach this way," which is why I was like, "We need to be face to face for this. This is a face to face communication where I can draw with a sharpie and whatnot." So he wasn't ready. It wasn't the way I preferred, um, and it wasn't working. And we both got frustrated. I was like, "Dude, let's just get together, have a beer, and then we can do this." So. That was a good mini observation. I just thought of that. That happened this morning. That's why that failed. Okay. Alcohol, though. Alcohol helps with everything. I shouldn't say that. That's a terrible thing to say. It It's a gr one. How about one drink helps with most things? After after the first, it's like it, you know, it could go here nor there. We don't know where it's going to go. Um, so the last thing, I mean, we've been talking about this through the whole conversation, is like how do we become stronger communicators? Um, this is a little cheese, but like, yeah, my course tomorrow, but like, Honestly, like just like paying attention, like picking up that weight will make your biceps stronger. Like looking at communication strategies and like saying, how do I become better? It ain't on accident, right? You don't get stronger biceps on accident. Yeah, I think it's about being much more mindful about communication. I think it's measuring the impact of it. Like treat it like a real thing. Don't just think, oh, it's just this thing, communication. Like like marketing. It's just this thing people do. Like, no, you know, be measure the responses of the people who heard you speak do surveys and see if they heard you how many people showed up to the event and and get feedback from people and and put and do specific tactics yep. to, and put make plans like in the next 90 days i'm going to do these things and reach this goal so this is a lot about time management and execution yes. but treat communication like a real thing i mean i honestly jimmy i I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of people who are going to listen to me now. And I've had people say to me, they're like, you've got a lot better. You know, 10 years ago, if you put me on something like this, I'd have been sweating. I wouldn't know what to say. People would say, why are you putting yourself in those positions? And I'm like, because I want to get better at it, because it's really important if we want to deliver great care to our community. So yeah. I have to be a better communicator. I have to be better at public speaking. I have to be able to get up in front of 200 people or 500 and speak. And I'm not saying I'm an expert at it now by any means, but I didn't used to be any, I used to be a sweating, shaking mess. And people would say, why are you putting yourself through this? I'm like, because it's really important to be better at this if I want to reach the goals and want to be able to help the community. It's, you know, it's a real thing. Yeah. My first time on the radio was on a, uh, like a 3000 watt college station in St. Bonaventure, New York. So like about nine people were listening. It was midnight to 2 AM. The first time I ever was on the radio and I, I did my first mic break, played my first song, went to the bathroom and vomited. <laughs> that was the first mic break. And it was nerves. I'd been thinking about it all week. And I was like, I'm going to college to be in radio and this is it. Do not screw this up. Cause you're in the big time now, baby. 
I was in a town of 3000, like, but to me, it was built so much in my head and literally went and vomited. And then I was like, all right, well, it can't get worse than that. Right. So let's go do this again. And the second time I didn't vomit, I was like, well, there's a victory, but yeah, flexing that muscle. I got a colleague, uh, Julie Vazone, and she works with Fox rehabilitation and she will tell you, she doesn't like giving presentations, but her, 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 her role at Fox is to give presentations and she's really, I mean, she's great one-on-one. -on -one, lights out like she is calm cool and collected it's when you put her in a room so what did julie do she said i every every big presentation thing i want to you have to put me up there and i was like wow bold and has she gotten better yeah is that a shock oh my gosh you you flexed a muscle and it got stronger is she a pro now yet no is she done no has she, is she coming off the stage yet also no yeah. so. exactly. and there's books and there's ways to learn about it i mean i listened i'm not a reader Everything is on audio books. So, you know, I listen to everything. Um, but I took courses. I learned. Here's how you put together a presentation. Right. Here's how you communicate with people. Um, and I think that to piggyback off, you'd asked earlier about what we do with our staff. You know, I talk to our staff, like, when you first meet a referral source or someone in the community, right. what do you say to them first? What do you think about? Um, a friend of mine, Scott Wick, out in, who, does, who specializes in marketing at Therapeutic Associates, always had this great tip, which I love, is like when you meet someone for the first time and you're a little nervous, say nothing but look at them and think to yourself, some, what is something you like about that person? Now, you don't have to say anything to them about it, but as soon as you think, oh, I look at Jimmy, I like your glasses. If I'm thinking to myself, I like your glasses, they look good, automatically my own body language changes. I feel a little more relaxed and I become a little bit more authentic. And it's a really simple trick, but when you all those people who are nervous about, oh, I'm going to meet this person or deal with this, the first time they, if they look at someone and think, what do I like about this person? They suddenly, their whole mindset changes. And then the next thing is, all right, and now you're going to say something, something in common, make a statement, open-ended thing. And now you're going to tell them why you're here or what you want. Like, there is a science to it and there is a way to work with it, but you've got to learn it and you've got to take time with it and not just going to think if I just practice, I'll get better, but put the time in and you'll be a better communicator, not just with your patients, but with all these other people in the community that will ultimately help us be seen as primary care providers and help us get paid for what we deserve. That's the full circle of this conversation because we started talking about like, how do we become the musculoskeletal experts? How do we make sure? How do we make sure people understand what well, you can't convince a, an entire group? You have to convince people. People make up a group. It's still people and people have brains and we want to we're, we're wired like we're, we're not that much different than when our ancestors sat around a fire and communicated. So why do stories resonate? Because that's how we that's how we learned. Why, Right. Why, why, why are the, the first stories we learn or the first things we teach kids um, stories with beginnings and middles and ends and a moral weave through there? I told a friend today, why are most heroes in fairy tales kids? It's because they need to be able to see themselves in the story. Mm. You know, like, wait, is that true? I'm like, think about all the fairy tales. Like, you want to be able to see yourself in the story so you can say, I want to emulate this behavior because that's the point of that lesson. So I love that being able to say those. What about resources? Like if someone's nodding along and like you, you listen to books, I listen to books, but I also read, I would say I, I grabbed three off the shelf. One was the one we referenced before Chris Voss, never split the difference. This negotiating as your life depended on it. This dude was a former FBI hostage negotiator. Um, and it doesn't make any, like, why would I read a book about hostage negotiating as a PT? And he just goes in like every conversation is a negotiation for time, attention, information every conversation in your personal life and your professional life and when i flipped it like that as a guy who has a degree in communication in 15 years i was like oh my god i never thought about that um i would say talk like ted is a good book too yeah, yeah. Book watched like a million ted talks and like scienced it and was like here's why these are successful and then building a story brand from donald miller i lent it to a friend but that's another one donald miller also has marketing made simple oh, I, don't yeah. know that one. I need to listen to that uh, I would say start with building the story brand, which is the other one mm -hmm. really about narrative communication. Like how do you break, like what you just said about that trick your friend gave you, like think about something that you like, like you're automatically thinking about the other person, not like, Hey, I'm Jimmy. Listen to how great I am. Like that immediately turns Michelle off. If I'm like, Hey, I'm Jimmy and I'm an expert. You're like, Oh, that's cool. But like, I don't really understand. Cool. Like 
but bringing the person into your conversation to make them the hero that's what like kind of building that's a, a little nugget of building the story brand is there anything that you like well you know what maybe don't blow it because we have three questions you're gonna have to answer one of those and that's usually what uh, uh, well, actually i'm sitting here on my phone looking at my aud audible list i'll jump to a couple of them i really like i lo really like renee brown's work oh yeah i mean i think she's really interesting and fascinating and helps you you know get comfortable with who you are so you can be more authentic um i think that's great um option b by cheryl sandberg i'll tell you personally i'm not a big cheryl sandberg fan however i do like that book that she um came up with and i honestly really love listening to um stories about people so shoe dog food you know the shoe dog story oh, still night you know, um, Michelle Obama's book, like listening to those leadership, the, the books of people who have been very successful in their own ways and hearing their stories. And again, that's the storytelling. I think I find tremendous value in. Have you listened to How I Built This from NPR, Guy Raz? Oh, I love How I Built This. That's both. That's stories in a kind of, well, he's got a book now, but podcast form. So it's like, hey, you know, Spanx. Why, do, why does like a 40-year-old guy care about Spanx? But like, she teaches you a lot in her story, and they told that really well. Um, all right, tomorrow live, you're doing that panel discussion, telehealth, where you get to play the devil's advocate. Wait, that's got to be fun, too. We are just like, I don't know. Prove me wrong. Poke the bear. Um, the uh, the message, the uh, the link is in the comments below if you want to head to the Northeast Regional Conference. Again, uh, get your uh, get it live tomorrow on November 7th, or you can, uh, you can listen to those recorded through the end of the year. Um, I'm excited. I'm I'm doing again the Twelve Commandments of uh, of communication. It might be more by tomorrow by the time I actually get this to <laughs> stage here in my living room. Welcome. That's what I'm going to open with. Welcome to my living room. Um, are you ready for three questions? I think so. Good. Three questions brought to you by our friends at Arius Medical Staffing, A-U-R-E-U-S Medical.com. Leaders in hashtag travel physical therapy. Um, I don't know. Do what you want to do, which is be a great physical therapist or physical therapist assistant uh, where you want to do it. And by where, I do mean geography. Like they have positions in all 50 states in D.C., but also like what setting? Because a lot of times people will be like, oh, it's just outpatient ortho. And I'm like, it's not actually. I thought it was too when I was a student. So check out what they have to offer. A-U-R-E-U-S Medical.com. Uh, go there. A-U-R-E-U-S Medical. Dot com. Three questions. You're no stranger to this one. So first question is a where question. You're in Rhode Island, but once it's safe, I'm prefacing it, once it's safe to travel and approved, uh, where in the 50 U.S. would you want to go but you haven't been yet? Well, um, last time I was on the show, I mentioned Colorado and I said I wanted to get high, but it wasn't. It was because I wanted to be in the mountains and hike and snowboard. It wasn't for other reasons. Um, but I um, would say... I would like to just, I'd like to get back to Vermont even now. Vermont and go snowboarding. <sighs> Why not? It's the good time of year to do that. They just got some snow just the other yeah, day. Yeah. In, in early November. Uh, second question is a what question. So similar to like, you know, book, movie, podcast, what's something you'd, you'd suggest for the audience that has value that you, you like? Um, I'd suggest you actually listen or read Top of Mind by John Hall. Top of Mind, it, it's really about relationships and it has a marketing spin to it, but it's how do you stay top of mind? And I think that's really important for our profession, for all of us. We, you know, when someone says, how do I move better? You want them to think I see my physical therapist. All right. That's on the list for me then, because I was just having conversations about this, right? Like if I said, Michelle, how tall is Mount Everest? Like, what would you do right now if I threw that at you and said, I'll give you a hundred bucks if you can tell me in 30 seconds. I'd like, Google it. You, you'd, you'd grab your phone, right? Yeah. In a year or two, we're going to get more custom. And I got like seven devices in my house named Alexa. Oh yeah. So, yeah. but here's the thing, right? When you Google it, you're gonna go. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna look at the first two or three, right? Yep. Those devices. It's one response. It's binary now. You are either the response or you are not the response. Oh, what a great point. Top of mind is now on my list because, like, yeah, how do you get top of mind? Because it used to be like you need to be on the first page at least for Google, right? Which is hard but possible. But now we are binary. We are all, you are the answer or you are not the answer when we start to go. Wow. Through. What a great point, Jimmy. I love that. Scary, isn't it? Yeah, it's scary. I don't think we're there yet. And I have a lot of these devices, but it's go. It's going to happen, right? Like it's like it's going to happen. Voice is the way to go. Um, so that uh, uh, third question is 
uh, who question? Who should? Who is someone the audience should know more about? Another good question. I'm going to say I'm going to say Mike Horsfield. I'm going to do a shout out for my friend Mike Horsfield over at Rock Valley. He just became president, new president for PPS. He did congratulations. Um, Mike. Yeah, he did, and he has been really instrumental at help doing a lot of peer-to-peer -peer work and a big KPI project for PTs and practices so they can be more successful. Um, but he's just a great mentor, a very good friend and a huge advocate. And um, and I think he will serve our profession really, really well. How long is the term for PPS? Is it a year, multiple years? Um, it's uh, three, year, year, yeah, three, three years, I think. Yes. And he's a terribly nice guy. I mean, there's a lot of nice people in PT, but like he's like a, he's, I don't know. He's just, I mean, I met him like two or three times. Just a terribly nice guy. He's a terribly nice guy, exactly. And he's funny. Yes. And he's authentic. Yeah. And he's an incredible listener. And all he wants to do is help people. He is so yeah. passionate and humble. You know, all of those attributes that you just like him. That's it. All right, that's uh, three questions. Mike Horsfield, expecting good. We got to get him on the show. Yeah, you should. Absolutely. Put in a good word for me. No. Um, three questions brought to you by Arius Medical Staffing. Again, A U R E U S medical.com. Last thing we do is the parting shot. Parting Shot is brought to you by our friends from the Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy. Find them online at orthopt.org. Uh, leaders in orthopedic physical therapy. I was I was kind of perusing their current concepts of orthopedic PT course, just kind of seeing what I could learn. Um, it's in depth. This is really the course you want to take if you want to take the OCS exam, a great prep course. And I was just looking at the uh, reference list. That alone is going to give you a wrist cramp as you scroll through that thing. So it's uh, it's in depth. I mean, you're this is the current stuff. That's why it's called current concepts. See what they did there with the name? Uh, so find it online at orthopt.org. A lot of different independent study courses there as well. Uh, parting shot, Michelle, your last chance for the mic drop moment. Uh, what do you want to leave with the audience tonight? What do I want to leave? I just want to really say... Be brave. You know, we all love our profession. So have the courage to be authentic and brave and put yourself out there. And um, you really got nothing to lose. Yeah, honestly. I mean, I'll say this too. Um, I'm guilty of this as well, which is like I was putting my presentation together for the, for the Northeast Regional Conference. And I found myself falling into the traps that I tell people. I was like, well, I'm not, I don't want to make this too fun because I want it to be serious. And I was like, hey, they asked me to speak. They read my abstract and like, you know, maybe they heard my podcast before. I was like, so I got to make sure I do, you know, make sure we constantly remind ourselves to be yourself and be authentic. They didn't ask for a presenter to come. They asked you to come and present, share you, be you, be authentic on stage. So I love that. Yeah. And yeah. And, and don't be scared to do that because if someone doesn't want to watch you, they'll turn you off. Yeah. That's, the, I mean, we, we understand that. Right. And we do that all the time. We're flooded with messages all the time. So if you don't want something, don't be shy about it. And I tell people that all the time, like, and that is a good KPI of a communicator. How many people listen to your entire message versus okay. touch it? Uh, on Twitter, on uh, Instagram at performance PTRI. And the website again is performance PTRI.com. Michelle, looking forward to uh, your panel tomorrow as you poke the bear with telehealth health and uh, appreciate you stopping by the show once again we'll have you back on soon thank you so much jimmy